My word is it good to be back doing a proper weightlifting house news show. Again, the only weightlifting news show in the world. And this week we have a ton of just straight news, but it's really, really interesting news. The IWF have edited and changed the way that athletes qualify for the Olympics after having made them do things that aren't going to count. And so China is really pissed off. Simon Martirosian, the world champion from Armenia, is facing, he's undergoing criminal charges. And New Zealand's Laurel Hubbard is going to be the first transgender athlete, not just weightlifter, athlete ever to qualify for the Olympic Games. As I said about 20 seconds ago, welcome back to this week's episode of the Weightlifting House news show, the only weightlifting news show in the world. Now, part of the reason that I've not done so many of these style videos since all of these Continental Championships is because Weightlifting House just moved into some new premises. I'll get some footage. Maybe there's some playing right now. Probably there is. Uh, and just so it's been a lot of painting, decorating, carpeting, rebuilding kitchens, moving out old things and just moving all of our stock and all of our, uh, well, everything we own, desks, all that sort of stuff into the new premises. So there will be more content coming out of there. But that's why I've not been here so much. Also, the way I'm going to do this episode is because there's so much just general news. I'm just going to turn this into a news episode more so than lifts. But what I will do is we'll just put up some of the biggest lifts that I've found that I've curated from over the last couple of weeks that we've missed up. So whilst you're listening and learning about what's going on in the sport of weightlifting, you can see some of these big lifts right next to me. Okay, so let's do the qualification breakdown, the changes to it. So the Continental Championships all happened last month in the Asian Champs, European, Pan American Champs. National, Continental and World Records were all set. And basically after 14 months of no competition, athletes had to make it to these competitions as a priority for them. They had to spend money to get extra team doctors, navigate through really tricky visa application processes because of what's been going on in the world, quarantine for weeks in advance and after these competitions all to solidify their slot for the Olympics. But did they really have to do that? Well, it turns out probably not. The IWF finally released their updates to the Olympic qualification system, and it's certainly frustrated most athletes and countries out there. Now, because of the pandemic, the qualification process has already been through a bunch of different changes over the last year, but the latest change is perhaps the most significant. So originally, as you all know, the qualification process for the Olympics was due to happen over three six month periods from November 2018 all the way to April 2020. And athletes would have to compete six times, taking their best performance from each of those three qualification six month periods, plus their next best. Then those four totals would essentially count towards their rugby point ranking for the Olympics. But then of course, when this third period was curtailed by the pandemic and then the Olympic Games themselves were, well, originally not going to happen and then delayed by a year, it was decided to add a new third period, essentially just an extension of what was going to be that third period. We'll just call it period 3B instead of 3A, uh, while keeping the qualification process essentially the same, basically unchanged. What would then happen with this new 3B period is that athletes would be required to compete at least once in the new 3B period, this extension of period three that happened after the whole world shut down for that year. And presumably this was just in part so that athletes couldn't just do some kind of 18 months untested drug bender right up until the Olympic Games just completely sourced out of their mind. And so it was a way essentially, I guess, to get another testing session in for all athletes and also to allow athletes who hadn't qualified or hadn't put in a performance during 3A to get a total in during 3B. Now with some really important 3B competitions already completed, for example the enormously important and busy Asian Championships, European Championships, Pan American Championships and then with some postponed until after the Olympics, the new IWF rule makes all 3B schools irrelevant. And this is for almost all athletes. So all of those continental championships that we just watched last month that were wildly important and interesting and we believed were going to solidify and finalize rankings for the Olympics, they didn't really make a difference or matter at all. The new rules say that athletes don't need to have competed in period 3A or 3B 
at all. In fact, the best score from period one and period two will count, along with the next two best scores from any period. So you could have your best from period one and period two, and then just take your next two best, which might have been in period one again, and then nothing from period three. And now before all the questions come flooding in, no, Rustami still won't be able to qualify because you need a total from period one and two, and then your next two bests. He doesn't have one from period two. So this announcement obviously is, is really frustrating. Why the IWF didn't just work this out sooner? It was pretty obvious that this was going to have to be done, implemented, I don't know. But this announcement will be, uh, well, of great happiness, I suppose, great relief to the athletes from Oceania because that Continental Championships was going to be postponed until August after the Olympic Games. The delay of announcing this rule change has really, really aggravated, annoyed a lot of national federations who sent athletes to other Continental Championships in, in, in April, basically thinking that they were absolutely mandated. China in particular has been extremely vocal in its criticism of the IWF and their lack of transparency and decision making around this change to Olympic qualifying. Okay, let's go over now to Team China and talk about how angry they are at the IWF. This is a separate story now. So way back in February, I think it was, with the Oceania Championships postponed until after the Olympics, it became very clear that there was going to have to be a change to this period 3B. And the IOC wrote in March, the amended qualification system will be published soon. That soon actually did not happen until this week. It took literally months, more than two months later. And during that time, as I mentioned, the European, the Pan Am and the Asian Championships took place. Now, the Team China headed up by Zhu Jinquang, who is the president of the Chinese Weightlifting Association, who I've mentioned before is running for president of the IWF, which I'm looking forward to being able to talk more about that at some point, is absolutely livid about this. So you know how Team China is. They do everything perfectly. They don't leave anything to chance. And so assuming that their presence was totally required in order to qualify for Tokyo, Team China took a zero risk kind of policy. Now in quotes again, this qualification system came too late because of the IWF's lack of professionalism and its failure to act in a timely manner amid the pandemic situation. That's from Zhu once again. A further quote, take the Chinese team for example. It cost about $500,000, that's 360,000 pounds, 415,000 euros for the 57 person team to participate in the Asian Championships, which is, what is that, like close to $9,000 per person in total that averages out at. Probably Lou and Xi are taking up at least 20K each, so you know it was an expensive trip. So it cost them this much money for the 57 person team to participate in the Asian Championships, which proved to be an entirely unnecessary event for us to attend, not to mention the four week quarantine after returning to China. And then this was taken from Lu Xiaojun's Instagram page, which obviously he didn't write, but the people who he works with wrote. And it said, upon arriving back to China, the team had to quarantine for three days in a hotel. And then they will be taken to a training facility where they will quarantine for an additional four weeks, not to mention the fact that they had to quarantine, self-isolate before they went away. This is gonna be at least a two month process for all of those Chinese athletes trying to make it to the Olympics, you know, being away from family and friends. It's kind of ridiculous they all had to go through this. Back to a quote. There are hundreds of people like us who did not need to participate in non-compulsory events and took the travel risks to the European Championships and Pan American Championships last month as well. All of this could have been avoided if early action had been taken by the IWF. And then Zhu Jinquang went absolute savage mode on the IWF. Quote, the IWF is non-athlete centered. And the fact that individual leaders care only about their own interests and votes for the upcoming elections is leading our sport to the edge of self-destruction after corruption and doping scandals in the IWF. If no changes are made, weightlifting is facing a big risk of being expelled from the Olympic Games. So obviously he's extremely annoyed about what happened to Team China, but he's also showing a lot of empathy to what's happened to all member federations around the world, which I suppose you can kind of do when you're sat right at the top. Uh, you're able to be nice and caring and not too worrying about these other countries because you know that they're not going to beat you. It just builds favor for you. Zhu Quang is pushing really hard for more athlete representation in the sport. 
uh, essentially taking the power away from the few, the old guard who've been running the sport into the ground and then trying to spread it amongst the athletes, the federations, essentially those of us who actually form this sport. He even said that the cronies who are still there have, quote, driven our sport away more and more from the youth, the public and the market. And I mean, just to conclude this part of the story, the fact that so many athletes and coaches and I suppose even media had to put their health at risk to some degree, or at least just go through something that really wasn't necessary, uh, is just ridiculous. The lack of transparency from the current board is a shambles. Now, I obviously joked a little while ago with Seeker Strength, Owen and Dare, and, and with Zach that we were going to create our own federation and do this thing right. And, you know, that's tongue-in-cheek, but part of me, every time I read these stories, I just think, my God, why? Why don't we just do this? Why don't we just take the sport into our own hands and sort something out? But it's not as simple as that. So probably that won't happen, but you never know. We might do the odd one-off kind of competition. We'll see. Very quickly, just to round part of this off, let's just talk about the African Championships, which was supposed to be this month in May. So the long and short of it is that the African Champs were delayed and they were supposed to be going ahead this May, this month right now, uh, in Madagascar. But then Madagascar closed all borders but the AWF, the African Weightlifting Federation, still claimed that they were going ahead, which was ridiculous because you literally could not get into the country. Madagascar wasn't letting anyone in. So now the IWF has finally confirmed that it doesn't matter. They, they have announced that this competition has been cancelled. So athletes are thinking, great, I now don't need to try and get there. And also, obviously, they've announced that because now the African Weightlifting Federation knows that this 3B qualifying doesn't even matter anyway. But moments after I wrote this, I literally just checked the IWF website again, the African Championships are back, and now they've been moved to Kenya, uh, which is really, really bizarre. So with so much fluctuation of what's going on, if you're set to be competing, check, because this may well have changed again by the time this comes out in a day or two. And also just be aware, if you were feeling like you needed to compete here, you don't necessarily need to compete. So just check where you're sat in the rankings, and work it out. You might not need this total at all, so don't go through anything unnecessary here. All right, let's move on to Simon Martyrosian. Simon Martyrosian, the 2019 world champion, the 2016 Olympic silver medalist, youth world record holder, senior world record holder, current total world record holder, days after bombing out at the European Championships last month, reportedly due to a serious injury, I think, of the knee, uh, somewhere in the leg, which he sustained while fighting Azerbaijan in the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war. Simon Martyrosian hit and killed an Armenian man while driving his Mercedes. So a criminal case is currently underway looking at, uh, this is a quote, this is exactly what they're, what they're talking about here, the violation of traffic and vehicular rules negligently causing death. So I don't think that they think, I don't think anyone thinks that Simon actually purposefully, you know, went for this guy, uh, which obviously I, I don't know why anyone would assume that he did because that's not really what people ever do. But it was to do with, I suppose, a negligency of his driving that they're, that they're researching, that they're looking into. Simon Martyrosin claims that the man stepped out in front of him suddenly and there was nothing that he could do. Uh, and this did, in, I guess, Simon's defense, uh, this all happened in a non-pedestrian area late at night quite how they work these sorts of things out i have no idea my feeling is unless there's a camera i don't quite know how you work out whose fault it was in this situation either way the stress that this is going to put on simon martyrosian if he didn't you know if he wasn't being negligent just the fact that he's undergoing these these charges are gonna basically screw him over and i i would have thought for the olympics i mean this is not going to be an easy thing to overcome who knows? Or it turns out that he was being really negligent, in which case he should face the ramifications of this charge. So Martyrosian, immediately after he killed this man, well, the guy was actually alive um, after he hit him, he immediately called an ambulance and then he helped accompany the unconscious man to the hospital, but the man died en route to the hospital. Martyrosian was, you know, at the scene, tested, uh, and wasn't found to have any alcohol or drugs in his system. If he is found guilty of causing death through vehicular negligence, uh, he could receive up to five years in jail, which would obviously prevent him from competing at the 2020 Tokyo Games, which is in 2021, but it's still called the 2020 Games, 
and the 2024 Olympic Games in Paris. I'll keep you totally posted on everything that comes out from this, but that's where we sit right now. I mean, Simon's one of those guys who he's so amazing as a weightlifter, but he still doesn't have an Olympic gold medal to his name, which we all assume that he does, but he doesn't because Nerudinov, Roslin, Uncle Roslin, as Sergei Putsov calls him, uh, won last year or last quad in 2016. All right, now the final story of the week is to do with Laurel Hubbard, who has already been in the news a bunch, you know, over the last few years, really because of this kind of transgender topic. But once again, she's back in the news. So let's go through this a little bit. Also, some stuff has come out about Laurel Hubbard over the last 24 hours. I've not had time to research it properly to do with some other car accident. Uh, I don't want to go through it now because I don't have all of the facts and I need to do the research to, to do justice to, to whatever the story is. So I might talk about that next week if there's something there. But here's what we have right now. This is a quote from the BBC, which is just amazing that the BBC would pick up on something like this. Weightlifter Laurel Hubbard has taken a step closer to becoming the first transgender athlete to compete at an Olympics after qualification rules were changed because of COVID-19. Now, actually, as far as I can tell, the changes in the rules didn't really make a difference. They're not the things that gave Laurel Hubbard her place at the Olympics, which by now she basically does have a place. So Laurel already has the points qualified to be ranked in a position to go. I think what they're talking about is the fact that there was a time where they thought that at the very least you had to weigh in, go to a competition in 3B, so that they could just drug test you and make sure you hadn't done an 18-month drug bender. And because Laurel didn't go to, well, no, yeah, didn't go to a 3B competition because there's no Oceanic Championships, then Laurel wasn't going to be able to go. That's the same situation that a lot of these Oceanic athletes were in. But because now 3A and 3B don't matter, that's not a problem. So now, despite not actually having a total during period one at all, Laurel has 1,993 points, which some of you might know a bit about Roby points and know that doesn't sound like many. And it's not. It's nowhere near enough to qualify in any other weight category, really. In fact, it's fewer than 42% of the Roby points that that category's leader, Li Wen Wen, has accumulated. I mean, Li Wen Wen's got like 4,600, and Laurel Hubbard has 1,993. But it is enough to qualify in well, just in the, the far less competitive plus 87 kilo category. Essentially, Laurel Hubbard is able to do, to qualify for the Olympics, what Rustami can't do because Rustami is in a far more competitive category. Laurel is able to take the best score from period two and, the, and Laurel's best from period one, which is a zero, add two more, and they're probably from period two as well, uh, and those three uh, accumulated are higher than other people's four competitions accumulated. So essentially, Laurel will actually qualify in the continental spot because Fejeja Stowers from Samoa is going to be sitting in the top eight. So that means that Laurel, as the next best from the continent, will get the continental spot, despite being quite way down in the rankings and not having anywhere near as many Roby points. Now, Laurel does have a best individual total, however, of 285. So despite being way down, actually has, once you remove the extra Chinese athletes and North Korean athletes, the, the Russian athletes who are duplicated or who aren't allowed to compete or who are choosing not to go and compete, once you remove them, Laurel suddenly has the fourth highest total in the category. That's behind Li Wen Wen. That would be behind Anastasia Lysenko from... Ukraine, and that would be behind Sarah Robles, who's got 290. Sarah's got 290. Anastasia's got 286. Lee Wen Wen's way away, you know, just absolutely mogging everyone. And then Laurel's got 285. So there's actually a really good chance that Laurel could be a medalist at this Olympic Games. Now, I'm not going to go into the, the conversation about transgender athletes on a YouTube channel as someone who's uneducated, talking to thousands of people who are also uneducated on this topic. It just seems so ridiculous to do. If you want to know more about this, we did do a really amazing episode of the podcast with Dr. Jordan Fagenbaum, MD, MS. Uh, he's a powerlifter and he is the founder of Barbell Medicine. He is far more qualified than me, than you, to talk about what this actually means. Um, 
I mean, look, we can all have opinions. I'm not saying that we can't have opinions. And it's actually really interesting to talk with people about those opinions. But I'm not going to sit here and say what I think necessarily uh, in front of all of you. I have spoken about it at length on other episodes of the podcast, which you can listen to. That's totally fine. But if you want to know like the factual side of things, looking at research, Dr. Jordan Fagenbaum, we did an episode with him on Weightlifting House. You can learn all about that there. All right, and that is the end, I think, of this week's episode of the Weightlifting House News Show. I quite enjoyed just doing news. I don't think this is going to be possible every single time because, well, there's not always this much news. And if there is, normally that's because some really not so good things may be happening in the IWF that we have to talk about. Hopefully that doesn't continue forever. Uh, I'll do more, just total less next time. But hopefully you've enjoyed watching some of these lifts up above me right now as I've been talking because there have been some really big ones. I mean, Nuruddinov hit 240. Lou was front scoring 240 for doubles, and Norin PR'd a clean and jerk again, and then again, and then again at 100. Lots of big lifts. Guys, really appreciate you all tuning in. Coaches Only is in, well, it's less than a month away at this point. We also have the new weightlifting house barbells. The Elite Bar is going to be with us in a week or two, which is really exciting. Uh, an even higher quality barbell than the house bar so that's going to be fun we have more products coming in very soon also so stay tuned for weightlifting accessories and our weightlifting house virus collab speaking of virus head over to virus international you can use discount code weightlifting house that gives you 10 percent off all of their products that's in the usa that's in europe that's everywhere in the world hugely appreciate you all tuning in i gotta run because i got a podcast with seeker strength in 15 minutes, followed by a podcast with Mike Tashir in two and a half hours, something like that. And I've got some more to do. Guys, I'll catch you all next time.